Paris, the 29th of August, 1944. General Charles de Gaulle, leader of the Free French forces in World War II, marches triumphantly through the newly liberated streets. After four years of occupation, the German forces surrender, and France's capital erupts with joy. Four years earlier, de Gaulle, then a relatively junior officer, had escaped to Britain as France collapsed. Around him gathered a group of men who were determined to keep the honor and spirit of France alive. Their symbol became Joan of Arc's Cross of Lorraine. And two years later, in the Western Desert, the Free French captured the world's imagination by holding out for two weeks at Bir Hakim against Rommel's panzers. They then fought gallantly in all European combat theaters until their country was liberated. The men who had been declared traitors by their own countrymen were finally vindicated when their leader arrived to review a victory parade in Paris. And France took her place again as one of the big four allied powers. France was bled white during World War I. Her leaders were convinced that she could never afford to fight another major war in Europe. They pinned their hopes on the Maginot Line, a belt of fortifications on France's eastern border to deter future German aggression. But in September 1939, France found herself mobilizing again for war with Germany. While her armed forces appeared strong enough to repel a second German invasion, France's military planning had been distorted by misplaced faith in the defensive power of the Maginot Line. When the Germans launched their Blitzkrieg in May 1940, the French had no answer to this revolutionary high-speed mechanized warfare. In less than three weeks, the Germans trapped the northern French armies, together with the British Expeditionary Force, in the port of Dunkirk. Among those rescued off the beaches and taken back to Britain were some 100,000 French soldiers. On the 5th of June, the Germans turned south to overrun the remainder of France. The vast majority of those Frenchmen who had been evacuated to England volunteered to return to their country. But it was too late. On the 14th of June, the Germans entered Paris. Two days later, the French decided to seek an armistice. Most of the people of France were numb with shock and resigned to their fate. They put their trust in the elderly Philippe Pétain, who had saved France in World War I through his defense of Verdun. Pétain had been made prime minister and was certain that only by making peace could he end France's suffering. On the 22nd of June, an armistice was signed with the Germans. Symbolically and humiliatingly, in the same railway carriage used by the Allies to accept Germany's surrender in 1918. While the Germans occupied northern France and all the west coast, Pétain's government was allowed relative autonomy over the remainder of the country. This became known as Vichy France, after the town in which Pétain established his regime. The Germans allowed France's overseas empire to remain intact, and the colonial administrations accepted Vichy as France's legitimate government. However, a few Frenchmen could not stomach defeat. 
and were determined to fight on. I refused the idea that we would stop fighting. We had an empire, we had a navy, we had good planes, we had gold. We had every reason to fight on. On the 16th of June, the day that the French government decided to seek an armistice, the virtually unknown officer, Brigadier General Charles de Gaulle, broadcast from London. Voyons que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés. De Gaulle had commanded an armored division during the recent campaign. He had then briefly been deputy minister of defense before being smuggled to Britain by the RAF when he realized that France was facing defeat. The British gave de Gaulle their official support as leader of a free French movement. He made further broadcasts to the French people. I invite all French people who wish to remain free to listen to me and to follow me. Long live France, free in honor and independence. But de Gaulle's message had little effect. The Vichy government declared him a traitor and condemned him to death in his absence. The prospect of de Gaulle raising forces to carry on the fight against Nazi Germany looked bleak. By mid-August 1940, the Free French strength in Britain was a little over 2,000 men. They drew their inspiration from Joan of Arc, the warrior heroine of 15th century France, adopting her symbol, the Cross of Lorraine. We were rebels. The position of a rebel was a very particular one. We were condemned to death. Our families were completely cut off from us. We had no news from them. Our pay was stopped. Vichy made it clear that our families and our children would suffer reprisals. But these threats were ignored by an increasing number of French men and women who rallied to de Gaulle's inspirational leadership. They were determined to free France from Nazi tyranny. Among the Free French were airmen, veterans of the Battle for France who joined the RAF. Thirteen French fighter pilots fought with great courage in the Battle of Britain. But the situation of the French Navy proved a major problem. Churchill was concerned that the French fleet might be used by the Germans. The terms of the armistice dictated that it should be demobilized under Axis control. Some French ships were in British ports, both at home and in the Mediterranean, when the armistice came into effect. But the bulk of the Navy was still in its bases in French North Africa. On the 2nd of July, 1940, after an ultimatum to join the British was rejected, British warships bombarded the French vessels in the ports of Oran and Mers el Kabir. Some 1,300 French sailors were killed by their former ally. Simultaneously, the French warships in British ports were seized by the Royal Navy. In most cases, their crews offered no resistance and allowed their vessels to be taken over. But scuffles on board the submarine Surcouf at Plymouth resulted in the deaths of three British sailors and one Frenchman. In the Mediterranean, a French squadron which had put into the Egyptian port of Alexandria allowed itself to be demilitarized by the British. But the deaths of so many French sailors at the hands of their former ally did little for de Gaulle's cause and increased Vichy French bitterness towards Britain. 
The first glimmer of hope for the free French came in the colonies of equatorial Africa, to which de Gaulle had sent a representative. Captain Philippe de haute Clock had been wounded during the battle for France, but managed to escape to England. There he took one of his middle names, Leclerc, to minimize the threat of reprisals against his family. Leclerc's first successes were in Chad and French Equatorial Africa, where he persuaded the colonial government to join the Free French. Simultaneously, de Gaulle had gained British support for a joint landing at the West African port of Dakar, in the hope that it could be won over to the Allied side. De Gaulle accompanied the Allied force, which arrived off Dakar on the 23rd of September. The Vichy authorities not only refused demands to surrender, but opened fire. In the subsequent engagement, they damaged a British cruiser and a battleship. The Anglo-French force withdrew, its tail between its legs. It was a terrible failure, a total failure. The next day, General de Gaulle called us together on his ship, and morale was very, very low. General de Gaulle told us, this is only a temporary setback. The general was right. The following month, he went to the Cameroons to consolidate his hold on the colonies won over by Leclerc. Gabon was secured in November, but only after bitter fighting with the local Vichy troops. At the end of 1940, the 13th Demi Brigade, the cornerstone of the Free French forces, which had accompanied de Gaulle to Dakar and the Cameroons, set sail to join the British in Egypt. Its tough French Foreign Legion troops were eager to get into action against the enemy in the desert. Meanwhile, in Chad, three French units under Colonel Jean Donano began to operate with the British Long Range Desert Group against the Italian forces in Libya's southernmost province of Fezzan. Donano was killed during a raid on the Italian airfield at Mozuc in January 1941. Leclerc took his place and set off into Libya from Chad with 3,000 men, supported by 12 elderly bombers. On the 1st of March 1941, the Free French captured the Kufra oasis. It was a significant achievement for the Allied campaign. The long-range desert group could now use Kufra as a forward base, and Leclerc cooperated with it on a number of raids on Italian outposts. While Leclerc's men were making their mark in the desert, the 13th Demi Brigade had reached Egypt. Reinforced with a battalion from Chad, this now formed the Brigade d'Orient and fought alongside the British to capture the Italian colony of Eritrea. The climax of the French campaign was spearheading the capture of the important Red Sea port of Massawa. More free French forces were gathering in Egypt during the first half of 1941. But their loyalty to the Allied cause was severely tested in June. Syria had remained under Vichy French control, and the British had initially left it alone. But in May 1941, there was a revolt against the British in neighboring Iraq. The Germans supported the rebels and obtained Vichy French agreement to use airfields in Syria. Once the British became aware of this, they decided to invade, fearing that the Luftwaffe and Vichy French Air Force would launch attacks against Egypt.
The Allied force included six free French battalions and an artillery battery, together with a few tanks. They attacked on the 8th of June, but soon faced bitter resistance. Three French liaison officers went in with the leading Australian and British units and tried to persuade the Vichy troops to come over to the cause of de Gaulle, but they were ignored. Frenchmen ended up fighting Frenchmen. During the battle for Damascus, foreign legion units went into action on both sides. It took six weeks to achieve victory and bring General Dents, the Vichy governor general, to the armistice table. But the majority of his soldiers continued to believe that de Gaulle and his men were traitors to France and only 6,000 of the 37,000 in Syria agreed to join the Free French. The rest were repatriated to Vichy France, where they were welcomed as heroes. De Gaulle was furious at not being consulted about the armistice. He resented the repatriation and, even more, the fact that the British, rather than the Free French, would now oversee Syria. During the autumn of 1941, the Free French airmen in Britain formed their first dedicated fighter squadron within the RAF, number 340, Ile de France, equipped with Spitfires and initially based in Scotland. At the same time, the airmen who had flown in support of Leclerc in the deep south of the Libyan desert became the Lorraine Squadron. Equipped with Blenheim bombers, this joined the RAF's Desert Air Force and began to fly operations in support of the British Eighth Army. The Free French Navy was also deeply involved in the Battle of the Atlantic. Its ships escorted convoys and battled against the U-boat menace. The corvette Aconi achieved the almost unique feat of sinking two U-boats in one day on the 11th of March, 1943. She rammed the first one, which had already been damaged, and forced a second to the surface, ramming it as well. The entry of America into the war in December 1941 meant that French possessions in the Americas could be taken from Vichy. Washington wanted to do this through negotiation, but in one instance, de Gaulle disregarded American wishes and took unilateral action. This was over the tiny islands of Saint-Pierre et Miquelon, off Newfoundland. De Gaulle ordered Admiral Émile Muselier, the commander of a free French naval task force in the Canadian port of Halifax, to seize them. Ignoring US and Canadian opposition, Muselier's force, led by the submarine Sir Couf, made an unopposed landing on the 24th of December, 1941. Most of the inhabitants were delighted to join the free French. De Gaulle's unilateral action over the islands outraged the American and Canadian governments. But for the time being, this mattered little. The main theater of free French operations was far away, in the deserts of North Africa, fighting alongside the British. By the end of 1941, the free French ground forces in the Middle East had been reorganized into two brigades and placed under the British Eighth Army. 
A small contingent also joined the newly formed Special Air Service and soon distinguished itself in raids on Axis airfields. General Marie-Pierre Koenig's first free French brigade became the first French ground unit to engage the Germans in battle since the disastrous summer of 1940. Koenig was a tough, no-nonsense soldier, and the bulk of his force was from the Foreign Legion. By spring 1942, the British were holding a defensive line running south from Ghazala in eastern Libya and preparing to mount another offensive against Rommel and his Axis forces. The defences consisted of a number of fortified boxes. The southernmost, based at Bir Hakim, was held by the Free French. This was protected by extensive minefields and barbed wire. The garrison was also well equipped with field and anti-tank guns. But like the other boxes in the Ghazala line, it had a major weakness. The box to its north was too far away to support Bir Hakim with artillery. General Koenig and his men were effectively isolated, with an open desert flank stretching away to their south. Soon they faced a crisis, because Erwin Rommel, the Axis commander, got his attack in first. On the night of the 26th of May, he sent his panzers round the south of the Ghazala line. Within 24 hours, they had got astride the 8th Army's lines of communication, creating increasing confusion in the British rear. Bir Hakim was totally cut off. The Italian Trieste Armoured Division and the German 90th Light Division attacked the free French box, but failed to make much headway. Rommel was forced to send back his crack 15th Panzer Division to help them. The odds did not look good. But the Free French were well dug in and determined to hold on for as long as their ammunition and supplies held out. The Axis armor was allowed to approach to point-blank range before being engaged. Every attack was repulsed. Eventually, after two weeks, with ammunition and food growing desperately short, Koenig was given permission to break out. He did so on the night of the 10th of June bringing 2,700 of his 3,600 men to safety. Any doubts about the courage and determination of the Free French had been totally dispelled. They had proved themselves true gladiators. The tide of war in the deserts of North Africa finally turned in late October 1942, when General Bernard Montgomery attacked Erwin Rommel's Axis forces at El Alamein. The two free French brigades in the British 8th Army took part in the advance, which drove the Axis forces out of Libya. As they did so, General Leclerc's force of 3,000 men, which had been operating in southern Libya for nearly two years, began to move north. After an epic 1,500-mile trek across the desert, he met Montgomery at Tripoli on the 23rd of January, the day on which the British arrived in the Libyan capital. 
Leclerc placed himself under Montgomery's command, and his troops joined other free French brigades to become the first free French division. This was soon to expand rapidly, for a major campaign had just begun in another part of France's overseas empire, which would bring fresh troops over to the free French. After much debate, the British and Americans had agreed that their first major joint operation would be to land in Morocco and Algeria. The aim was to clear the Axis forces out of North Africa by threatening Rommel from the rear. The Allies hoped that the Vichy administrations in Morocco and Algeria would come over to their side without opposing the landings. So the United States took the lead in putting out feelers. It had maintained diplomatic relations with Vichy France, while Britain was still hated for sinking the French fleet. The task was given to General Mark Clark, the deputy Allied commander for Operation Torch. He was secretly landed by the submarine HMS Seraph on the Algerian coast to negotiate with General Charles Mast, the commander of Vichy forces in the Algiers area. But their discussions were inconclusive. President Roosevelt had decided that de Gaulle's increasingly abrasive behavior made him an unsuitable figure to rally the French North African territories. Instead, he chose General Henri Giraud, who had escaped from German captivity in April 1942 and taken refuge in Vichy, France. At a secret rendezvous, HMS Seraph picked up Giraud and brought him back to Gibraltar. There he met the Allied commander of the landings, General Dwight Eisenhower, who told him that these would take place the following day, the 8th of November. The Allies landed near Casablanca in Morocco and at the ports of Oran and Algiers in Algeria. At first, the Vichy French resisted fiercely, especially in Algiers. But the following day, Admiral Jean Dallon, the Vichy head of French Northwest Africa, agreed to a ceasefire in Algiers, but not elsewhere. So fighting continued for two more days before Morocco and Algeria were secured. To the disgust of the free French, Dallon was left in charge, even though he made it plain that he still supported Pétain. He also arrested the free French supporters who had tried to capture him as the Allies landed. Nonetheless, Dallon agreed to work with Giraud, who was flown in from Gibraltar while the Allies prepared to bring the final Vichy French territory, Tunisia, onto their side. But they were now faced by large numbers of Axis troops which had been flown into Tunisia. Their loyalties divided. The Vichy French forces in the country offered no resistance at first. But as the Allies began to advance into Tunisia, Troops under General Alphonse Juin joined them and were put under First Army Command as the 19th French Corps. The Free French fought hard during the rest of the campaign in Tunisia. 
Leclerc's troops in particular played a leading role in Montgomery's assault on the formidable Marath Line defences in March 1943. While the military strength of the Free French was being built up, the political situation had changed dramatically. Dallon was assassinated by a young royalist on Christmas Day in 1942. De Gaulle agreed to join Giraud in a committee of national liberation, but within a few months he had regained his position as the sole leader of the Free French. When the Tunisian campaign ended in May 1943, the Allies held a victory parade in Tunis. A large contingent of the French corps took part, proof that France was beginning to regain her pride. It was now planned that the French corps would join in the Allied assault on Italy. But before they could do so, they had to be re-equipped with modern weapons. The troops were delighted with their new American tanks and other weapons, and trained enthusiastically to take their place in the Allied line. At last, the Free French were becoming a force to be reckoned with. It was also becoming clear that the liberation of their country was no longer a distant dream. But well before the Free French forces based in North Africa set foot in Europe, a French unit was already fighting there. This was the Normandie Aviation Regiment, which was fighting with the Russians on the Eastern Front. De Gaulle was determined to give active support to the Soviet Union. And after lengthy negotiations with the British and Russian governments, an air force unit was sent via Persia and Baku. After training on the Yak-1 fighter, the regiment went into action in March 1943. In 1944, the regiment was awarded the title Neiman for its part in supporting the crossing of that river. And by the time it returned to France in June 1945, the Normandie Neiman regiment had scored 273 victories. While the Normandie Neiman was beginning its two-year campaign, the Free French forces in North Africa were organized into an 80,000-man French Expeditionary Corps under General Alphonse Juin. This deployed to Italy as part of General Mark Clark's U.S. Fifth Army in the autumn of 1943. The Expeditionary Corps was soon involved in the grim battles to force the formidable mountain defenses of the Gustav Line, south of Rome. The backbone of the corps were the Goum, irregular mountain gendarmerie units which had traditionally policed the Moroccan countryside. They were tough and ruthless, recruited from peoples who had always used terror as a weapon, but highly respected by their French officers. The Goom's mountain warfare skills enabled the French Expeditionary Corps to unlock the Gustav Line by forcing the German positions overlooking the river Garillan. The French then took part in the advance on Rome and the liberation of the Italian capital. But as 1944 began, all free Frenchmen were increasingly concentrating on the ultimate objective, the liberation of France itself. The Free French Air Force in Britain was now contributing four fighter and three bomber squadrons to the Royal Air Force. Among its aces was Pierre Klosterman, who had been in Brazil when the war started, but had made his way to Britain and trained as a fighter pilot. 
Klosterman first flew Spitfires with number 341 Alsace Squadron. By the end of the war, he was commanding an RAF Tempest Squadron and flying a plane which he called Vieux Charles, an allusion to de Gaulle. He shot down 33 German planes in just two years of air fighting. Three French ships were also preparing to support the Normandy landings, their crews well hardened as a result of the long and arduous Battle of the Atlantic. On the ground, the main free French formation in Britain was the 2nd Armour Division commanded by General Leclerc. This had been formed in Morocco and then deployed to Britain in the autumn of 1943. Two free French parachute battalions had been incorporated in the British Special Air Service. All were waiting eagerly for the moment when they could set foot once more on their native land. The only free French troops to land in Normandy on D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944, were commandos. They were part of the British No. 10 Inter-Allied Commando, led by the dashing Philippe Kiefer, veteran of several raids. Kiefer and his men stormed ashore side by side with their British comrades. Soon they were being greeted by their jubilant countrymen. Other free French did drop into France as part of small special forces teams. Their task was to liaise with the French forces of the interior, the paramilitary resistance forces based in central France, and coordinate their operations. General Leclerc, whose journey back to France had begun over three years earlier in Chad, had to wait until late July before he and his division crossed to France. His American allies realized how much it meant to him to set foot on French soil after so long. Leclerc's division joined General George S. Patton's U.S. Third Army, which was poised to break out from Normandy. Calvados, the local apple brandy, spurred Leclerc and his men on their way, racing south and then east across France. Their ultimate objective was the French capital. The leading elements of 2nd Armoured Division reached Paris late on the evening of the 23rd of August. Amid the wild excitement, Leclerc was able to briefly slip away and speak to his father on the telephone for the first time in over four years. But then, it was back to business. For the French forces of the interior had risen against the German garrison in Paris. Bloody street battles were raging, and there was a danger that complete anarchy might take over. Early on the 24th, as the fighting in the streets continued, Leclerc reached the center of Paris. He took the surrender of the German garrison commander 
General von Choltitz. Many of his garrison also surrendered, but other Germans fought on. On the following day came the climax of the liberation of Paris. Charles de Gaulle visited the Arc de Triomphe to mark the culmination of his struggle to restore France's honor. His triumphant walk down the Champs-Élysées was punctuated by gun battles with die-hard Nazis. But de Gaulle was not to be denied his moment. For not only had Leclerc's troops led the liberation of Paris, but ten days earlier the Free French had been involved far to the south in the other great assault to liberate their country. Allied forces had landed in the south of France on the 15th of August. They included Alphonse Juin's French Expeditionary Corps, battle-hardened after its campaign in Italy. This was now part of the French First Army under General Jean de Latre de Tassigny, who had fought as commander of an infantry regiment in 1940 and had then commanded Vichy divisions in Tunisia and southern France. When German forces occupied southern France in November 1942, after Operation Torch, de Latre attempted to follow his orders and resist them. This resulted in a 10-year prison sentence from the Vichy regime but he managed to escape across the Mediterranean to Algeria. De Latre's first task was the liberation of the ports of Toulon and Marseille. His men rapidly cleared the Germans from both places to the delight of the local population. After this, de Latre's army joined the U.S. 6th Army in the advance up the Rhone Valley. This culminated in the liberation of Lyon on the 3rd of September. After bringing Leclerc under his command and absorbing elements of the forces of the interior, de Latre advanced into the Vosges region just north of the Swiss border. The French then fought a grim battle to eliminate the German forces around Colmar, the last obstacle barring their approach to the River Rhine. Not until early February 1945, was the way to Germany's last natural obstacle in the West cleared. In the final headlong advance into Germany, the French cleared the Black Forest and finished their war at Hitler's Alpine retreat, Berchtesgaden, now reduced to rubble by Allied bombers. But the crowning moment for the Free French came with the formal German surrenders at Reims and in Berlin. French representatives proudly took their places at the table with their American, British and Soviet allies. De Latre was a signatory of the Berlin surrender. Thereafter, the French were given their sectors of both Berlin and Western Germany to govern. France had regained her self-respect and was once more a major power. None of this would have been possible without the determination and vision of Charles de Gaulle and the few thousand Frenchmen who refused to accept their country's defeat. Their war had taken them from Britain, through Central and North Africa, Italy, and Northwest Europe.
it had been a long, hard road. Outcasts from their own land, these gladiators had kept the faith and eventually triumphed. 